imagine if we didn't have dogs guarding children and women while the men were out hunting. Or how ancient herders would have managed large flocks of sheep or cattle without the aid of herding dogs. Or how much more efficient hunters were with dogs sighting or locating prey by scent. So this is actually a selection, social selection, rather than the usual natural selection of nature. And this is based on the capacity of dogs to live with the humans through reduction of their fight or flight instinct. This is reflected in the evolu evolutionary changes in the dog's brain, specifically the limbic system. As dogs became domesticated, selective breeding for other useful traits led to the emergence of different types of dogs suited for a particular function. We have many ancient breeds. These dogs are essentially unchanged from ancient times, hundreds or thousands of years. They survived through time due to their hardiness and lack of, sorry, lack of, um, and relative lack of harmful genetic traits. I make no apologies in citing my own breed, the Pekinese, as one of the oldest breeds. As early as the 7th century Tang Dynasty, there were dogs called Lion Dogs in the Imperial Court. Its ancestors were in existence thousands of years before that. Breed survival or extinction hinges on man's efforts to maintain the breed as it existed. Breed extinction happens when there is no longer any interest in its function or role in society, or sometimes due to massive historical upheavals such as war and calamities. Breeders, then and now, are the safekeepers of the breed. These original breeders relied on traditional selection based on visible traits and temperaments or aptitudes through experience of what was passed on to their progeny. In the more recent past, they have used knowledge of Mendelian inher inheritance based on observations and experiences to guide their breeding practices. And we have these breeders to thank for a breed's condition for better or for worse. This, by the way, is my idol, Nigel Aubrey Jones. Now, dog breeding now is a little more different. With the current climate of animal rights activism and recognition of dogs as sentient beings, breeders are now more aware of their responsibilities to their breed of choice. They need to think first of their health and welfare, including good animal husbandry, better veterinary care, and proper breeding practices that will preserve and maintain breed health. Conscientious breeding takes into account first a breed's overall health and temperament and before confirmation. Otherwise, it is useless to have dogs that cannot perform its function. So this is just a table of what dogs are and what their traits are. And you have to choose the dog according to what you intend them to do. Here is a list of the breeders, conscientious breeders' responsibilities, or if you may, we may call it the Breeders' Ten Commandments. You learn the breed's history. Know the breed's family. Be aware of the breed's common health issues. Choose the healthiest stock available. 
breed with healthy, sound dogs. Preserve breed type. Avoid the popular sire syrophagin. Use genetic testing for harmful traits. Cooperation among breeders is a must and give your dogs the best care available. First, you have to know the breed history. Learn how the ancient ancestors were chosen, if known, and for what purpose they were bred for. Hunting dogs were chosen for their aggressiveness against their prey, and size varied with their prey. Herding dogs were chosen for their innate ability to corral and guide sheep or cattle. Harriers were meant to catch vermin, rats and badgers, etc., by going to the small holes in the earth. Thus, their name, terriers, from the Latin terror, and so are usually small. Working dogs were bred for carrying loads, rescue, and police work. Of course, toy dogs were meant to be house companions, and so are usually small. Number two, know the breed standard. Do you know your breed standard? Simple as it may sound, but many who are attracted to a breed initially often just go into it without learning about what makes a good specimen of the breed. It is important to know the breed structure and how it affects health, movement, and function. This is the typical dog structure most familiar with a lot of people. Most breeds will conform with it and it comes with a corresponding movement, usually called the normal dog movement. But there are many exceptions. It is important to know the breed structure and how it affects health, movement, and function. So the Greyhound is different from the usual dog, and so is a French Bulldog and the Dachshund. Again, I cite my brief because I'm most familiar with it. Um, according to what I read, it has the earliest breed standard. I'm sorry if yesterday there was an earlier breed standard cited, but uh, this is actually a point by point standard for the breed. This was penned by the Empress Dor Dorger to see of the Manchu dynasty in the mid 19th century. If you put this earliest standard, sorry, if you put the earliest standard against the current existing standard, you will see that it is actually basically unchanged. It is small. The swelling cape of dignity refers to its lion-like mane. Low is straightforward, large and luminous eyes. Nose like that of the Hindu monkey god. All point to its brachycephalic structure, but with good breathing because of the open nostrils of the monkey. And let its forelegs be bent definitely evokes the previous UK standard, which now says forelegs may be bent. Let its body be shaped like that of a hunting lion, is mirrored by its large chest and narrow waist. The piggly structure is different. It is a chondroplastic and at the same time brachycephalic. So this is uh, an illustration from the Piccadilly Club of America, Piccadilly's study guide, 2020 edition with permission to use, of course. And it shows you how the Pekingese is constructed. You will note that it's radically different from many breeds. The face is not totally flat. 
it slants backwards. So there is a muzzle there. Again, the Pugilis anatomy is unique in that it, it has a broad chest and corresponding adaptation of the front legs. So that chest with a slight bow in the upper arm to accommodate the chest. This leads to their slight rolling movement. Typical of Pugilis, I'm sorry, typical of Pugilis, uh movement, which is a smooth rolling gait. Number three, be aware of the breed's common health issues. We have a lot of breeds where there are common health issues. American Cocker Spaniels, cataracts and glaucoma, Labrador Retriever, progressive retinal atrophy, German Shepherds, hip dysplasia, degenerative myelopathy, Boxers, lymphomas, mast cell tumors, Doberman Pinscher, dilated cardiomyopathy, nature's nauseas, Diabetes mellitus, Pomeranians, alopecia X, Cavalier, King Charles Spaniels, mitral valve prolapse, and syringomyelia. These are very serious diseases. Number four, choose healthy stock to start with. Don't rush into buying the first dog that catches your eye. Look at several kennels first. Inquire about how long the average dog lives in your kennel. Ask to see the older dogs in your kennel, if they are active and healthy. That is a good indicator of longevity and good health in that line. And choose the correct sire or dam for the next litter. And this is why we need to understand breed anatomy to choose the correct sire and dam. And correct breed structure is also vital to judging our dog. Because we will be choosing the dog that will become the next sire or dam of the breed. So please judge us since correctly. Number five, start anew if there are serious health issues with initial stock. If you find after buying your initial stock that you have serious health problems, do not hesitate to discard these specimens and start anew. They may be good as pets. Otherwise, you will open yourself to heartbreak after heartbreak with breeding unhealthy dogs that will cost you huge veterinary bills. And I can cite an example of two dogs from the same panel who both came down with severe paralysis from intervertebral disc disease or IVDD and were paralyzed for life. That may be an indicator that that particular line may have the tendency for to be an IVDD. So not wise to breed from this specimens. So, with healthy sound dogs, dogs and bitches should complement each other. Don't double up on faults, especially in health issues, and preferably they should be both free of serious diseases or genetic traits. For outside studs, if the average age of older dogs in the kennel is normal for the breed lifespan, then it is a good indication of health and longevity. Check for fertility issues. This is very important when you have a diminishing gene pool. In females, infertility may be exhibited by irregular peaks or seasons, missed pregnancies, poor litter survival, or small litters for the breed. Early infertility in males is a problem. I've had a father and son from the same channel become infertile before seven years of age. 
check for sound temperament. Each breed has a temperament appropriate for its function. Aggressive behavior in unprovoked situations and excessive fear reaction are disqualifying faults, and this dog should not be used for breeding. On a personal basis, I am fortunate enough to have chosen a healthy breed to start with. Pikmins are known for long lives, majority living up to early to mid teens. The breed is free of debilitating diseases and genetic traits that the AKC does not have any recommendations for genetic testing. But you have to watch out for certain issues as well. There are, of course, no perfect breeds. The Pekinese may have certain issues, and these are what I came across with, both in my own kennel and in others. Early deaths may be indication of cardiomyopathy or other heart issues. It is best if you do necropsies to document such issues and request appropriate genetic testing. It is best not to breed with individuals more severely affected with entropion, dermoids, and other hereditary health conditions. If with boas, remove from breeding program. Strive to breed for more open nostrils like that of the Hindu monkey guard. Pekingese are often thought of as just lap dogs, but many have competed in obedience, agility, and speed events. Look at this show Pekingese chasing after a decoy in past cat event. Proof that a Pekingese with correct conformation can also breathe freely to compete in this event. I'm sorry, I'm not playing the, I thought I was supposed to click next, but it's not playing the video. Yes. Can you up there click on this picture, please? One, one back. Back again. One. Not working. Um, can we ask the uh, control people up there to uh, take their picture? Just one second, Ray. Please click on the picture. Uh, I'm sorry. I guess it, it's important to show this. So you think right. picking this get brief? We did it in 40 seconds. Pekingese can also compete in obedience and agility trials, earning non-confirmation titles. Again, behind the notion that brachycephalic dogs in general can breed properly. So we have a lot of Pekingese in obedience, agility. All these are good specimens of the breed, by, by the way. Pekinese can also be AKC certified, canine good citizen. He is one of my dogs earning a CGC from the AKC. Number six, reserve breed type. Avoid exaggeration or hypotype. More is not necessarily better. 
extremes in type become caricatures of the breed. Improvement must take into account health and temperament more than any others because the standard is there, just conform to it. There must be balance. So, this sharp A has too much skin for. That's the correct sharp A. Number seven, avoid the popular sire syndrome or what we call the founder effect. Many rush to breed with the most winning dog of the moment without regard for its suitability for the bitches. This is not advisable for several reasons. Loss of genetic diversity, especially if the gene pool in the breed is already small to begin with. And if this popular sire carries a deleterious recessive gene, for serious disease, it will spread that trait into the general population of the breed. Any serious faults he has, and no dog is perfect, will become prevalent in the breed. And diseases attributed to the popular sire syndrome include hypertoxicosis in Bedlington's, rage syndromes in English Springer Spaniels, and histocytic sarcoma in Bernie's mountain dogs. I cite an example of the pop, popular, popular sire syndrome that I have an experience with. In the 90s, a very well-known top team winning Pekingese became a popular sire. Almost every breeder took their bitches to him. His progeny was widespread in North America. As a result, I'm sorry. As a, As a result, uh, many inherited these loose shoulders and were out at elbow posing a jarring side-to-side -side movement rather than the desired smooth, effortless roll as in the standard. But judges were still enamored with the popular sire that they mistook the movement caused by loose fronts as a correct Higgins roll. So unfortunately, this misconception still occurs to this day. So there is lasting harm in the popular sire. Number eight, use genetic testing judiciously. Genetic testing is now becoming widely available. Multiplex assays, such as the wisdom panel, can detect many diseases or traits in one stroke. Some breeds have their own catalog of harmful genetic traits, which can be screened for. Blindness, debilitating inheriting inheritable conditions, or genetic predisposition to certain diseases. Uh, yesterday, there was a very interesting discussion of brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome. It is a constellation of physical findings with no particular genetic locus. So far, there is no genetic screening for BOAS can be due to a, a number of anatomic abnormalities such as pinched nostrils, elongated palate, enlarged tonsils, or collapsing trachea, and many more anatomic abnormalities. Um, we have to talk about genetic testing limitations. I'm, I'm dealing with human DNA testing, so I also um, have a little knowledge of this. Ideally, genetic testing should lead to the elimination of harmful genetic traits, causing early deaths, poor quality of life, and to lead, should lead to improvement of stock. It may not be totally possible to eliminate genetic diseases in any population, human or animal. Genes do not exist in isolation, and there is what we call the phenomenon of linkage disequilibrium, where genes are inherited as a package rather than single. So if you discard the specimen from the breeding pool based on the presence of a bad gene, you may actually be exchanging it for a worse trait or disease.
this out. Some genetic traits may be too widespread in a breed. And this may be due to the popular sire syndrome at some point in the breed's history. Eliminating a widespread genetic trait will lead to excluding a large population of the breed, leading to a severe reduction of genetic diversity. And we don't want that. So we can use genetic testing to calibrate breeding so as not to lose genetic diversity by employing dogs with certain recessive faults, but making sure we don't breed with the same genetic fault. So we have to identify major genetic issues in breeds. And we have to know when to discard individuals from a breed's gene pool. We don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because wholesale junking of breeding stock will lead to the breed's collapse. Another issue is genetic testing cost. Because in less developed countries, it is simply not affordable. Test average 100 US dollars, which is still prohibited when testing mainly dogs. There are other issues with DNA testing. Pet DNA testing is not regulated by governments. There's much to be done in this field to ensure accuracy and compatibility from format to format. Scientists generally express healthy skepticism about DNA companies' claims since these are based on a limited number of dogs tested. Even when accurate, interpretation of results is not as straightforward as being positive for a trait or risk factor does not necessarily mean the dog will come down with the disease 100% of the time. Number nine, operation among breeders is a must. Competitors in the ring maybe, but it should be, they should be allies in breeding. If you limit stock services to a few, that will severely decrease genetic diversity in the breed. We are all on the same team, the breed team. Number 10, dogs have best care available. Remember, dogs totally depend on us for their daily needs and health care. Provide the proper facilities with adequate space, feed quality food, appropriate weight and size, clean water must be available at all times, vaccinations must be current, keep your dogs clean, exercise according to breed needs, and consult the best veterinarian for health issues. But, and so tell it to me, meaning as is, but if it die, remember thou too art mortal. This is just reminding us of our own mortality as well. It's an illustration of the Empress Tushi on his death, on her death. Now we come to a very controversial issue. Is crossbreeding a solution to breed health issues? A lot of pressure even from veterinarians to implement crossbreeding in many breeds, especially for brachys and palates. Should be a last ditch effort to save a breed from extinction to, due to a markedly small gene pool because it can introduce worse genetic traits than regionally present. It has been done in the past, but there's have to be done judiciously. Ostensibly, they argue, the, those proponents argue, longer four phases will reduce or eliminate boas. But how long is long enough? Will it be to the point when all breeds begin to look the same? Is crossbreeding the only answer? Well, uh, I think I'll skip on this uh, slide because it has been discussed uh, yesterday. But 
what I can say is it can also be seen in non-brachycephalic breeds. It is not a guarantee that a longer forephase will be free from boas. If you implement that cross-breeding because simply because of brachycephalic features, you will destroy breed standards that have withstood the test of time. I believe the contentious breeder holds a key to maintaining breed health. We should be breeding for free breeding specimens through careful selection as past breeders have done. We must resist the homogenization of breeds, meaning breeds are beginning to look alike because of this pressure from outside. If all breeds look like the wolf, then the legacy of the past breeders will have gone to waste. And it will spell the end for our dog sport. I mean, why do you judge when everybody looks the same? Right? Let us protect and preserve the breeds we have come to love and cherish. We must celebrate the diversity in dogs as we celebrate the diversity in humans as we also come in different shapes, sizes, and colors. We must preserve the human dog bond. Are we to release our dogs to the wild as animal rights activists propose? That, that is where they belong. They do not. The ancient wolf, the dog descended from is extinct. Where is it going to go to again? Are we to disregard the EU's long, intimate, and mutually beneficial relationship that got us to this wonderful state of affairs where a dog will protect its human at the expense of its own life. We need the dog in all its forms, shapes, and sizes to make our lives complete, where dogs live comfortably side by side with the humans. To do otherwise is a shameful capitulation to the demands of a misguided fear. We should know better. Allow me to close with this quote from my well-known Westminster Kennel Club dog show host, Roger Andrew Harris. It sums up what many of us feel about our dog. And I quote, dogs are not our whole life, but they make our lives whole. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. So you open up to the audience. Is there any questions for Dr. Lowe? It's, it's not a question. Uh, we had many brilliant presentations today, but this one came from my heart. So thank you so very much. And I'm so happy all this presentation will be published in our tours by the PR committee. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Gracias por la presentación. Me encantó lo del decálogo de los creadores o los puntos claves de los creadores. Lo amé. Muy bonita. Quiero preguntar algo. ¿Por qué eh, tú hablas del macho de moda? Nosotros en los creaderos, bueno, yo Leticia en el creadero, tengo como una... ¿Listo? Ok. Tú hablas del macho de moda, ¿no? Que toda la gente quiere cruzar con él. Yo, por ejemplo, en mi criadero tengo un macho que es como mi macho reproductor. Eh, a él le eh, considero que tiene muchas cualidades. Y como tú dices, no hay perro perfecto. Sin embargo, 
yo quiero preguntar, ¿qué tan loable es tener solo uno o tener una variedad para que tengas, como tú dices, más diversidad? ¿O qué tú, 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 tú en tu crianza? ¿Tienes uno solo o tienes variedad de para tener más? Thank you for that question. Uh, I believe a bitch must be mated to it, the most suitable stud for her. So it's an individual selection. You do not just rush off to the most winning dog at the moment just because it's winning. That's what I'm saying. So you look at your bitch, look at what needs to be corrected in your bitch, And look for stud that will correct that. That is what we call complementary breeding. So you complement the bitch's faults by the stud's virtues and vice versa. Because no dog is perfect. Right? Even the stud, no matter how beautiful, will have a fault. And you don't want to double up on that fault. So I, myself, I have many uh, studs starts in my kennel. So I do not need everything to one dog. That is not a good practice. Thank you. Dr. Lowe, you mentioned the BOAS is not isolated to brachycephalic breeds. Could you just elaborate on that for me, please? Sorry, I was translator. Please, again. Actually, I'm just going to jump in there because that was covered yesterday with the Boas lectures, and there will be some more on Boas today. So maybe if you're still not clear, I suggest we can talk to Dr. Lo later. But it was covered in some detail yesterday by Nixa, and uh, Dr. Jane will be talking about Boas more about that. But I think he's referring to what your question would be. Exactly what um, Dr. Nixa spoke about yesterday about BOAS and not being restricted to racephalic breeds. Okay, one more question. Uh, Dr. Law, uh, we, were, we were talking last night about BOAS. And uh, I'd like to clarify you said that BOAS cannot be traced by DNA. It just develops. So can you elaborate? This is, is true, that boas cannot, if you DNA a dog, you cannot trace boas? From, from the latest um, articles I've read, pardon me if I didn't read the most recent one that has a contrary opinion, but so far I have not read about any genetic test for boas. There is no single genetic trait. Uh, maybe Ms. Dr. Lajo can explain that. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Lo. Un fuerte aplauso, muchísimas gracias, Dr. Lo. Excelente ponencia. I want to thank the FCI board members for giving Mexico the opportunity of having this important World Congress for Welfare and Health for the dogs worldwide. We are really pleased and thank you so much for giving us this great opportunity. And also I want to thank all the speakers from all over the world who participate in this great event. Thank you. <laughs>